Welcome to the You Matter podcast, where we host interesting people and have enlightening conversations. My name is Ned Burwell, and I'll be your host. Hello, I'm here with Mike Oglesby, and we're doing a podcast today. Mike's going to share a little bit about himself and what he's up to in life. I, he's a pretty inspiring guy. If you you go to his website, you you can certainly see he's got many qualifications, and he certainly has a lot of time in on the the his his field so welcome mike uh did i pronounce your last name right uh yes mike oglesby i get it all the time (laughs) i'm kind of used to it i i think i'm just gonna you know create a sign that just kind of you know shows it spelled out and how it sounds so yeah yeah, i'm used to that spelling yeah yeah (laughs) (laughs) so so mike let's start it with you telling me a little bit about yourself Okay, so I'm down in South Carolina, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, down here in the United States. Uh, For about uh, 12 and a half years now, I've been working with people professionally as a mindset coach, uh, utilizing different forms of NLP, hypnotherapy, pretty much any discipline or any modality that resonates with me. Um, And so, you know, I work with people on different fears that they have, anxiety, depression, things that hold them back, really working with the mind to create a new landscape so that we can move past these blocks and limiting beliefs and these things that kind of hold us back in life from doing and being and experiencing, you know, what we what we can in our potential. So I really take a lot of joy and pleasure in, you know, working with people and and just helping them discover new aspects of themselves so they can move past those barriers and just be, a, I guess, a, a greater expression in this world. Because I think that, you know, the greater we are individually, the greater we are collectively. And so helping one person isn't it doesn't just stop there. It goes it goes on and on and on, you know, for all the people that interact with them, they get touched by that person's life and so forth and so on. So I think we really are, you know, very interconnected. So this is my contribution to the world, I believe. Mm -hmm. And I I like what you said there about if we if we become stronger and better and and we empower others like we all improve. If if my consciousness shifts just a, a fraction, it improves the quality of many others. And when other people shift their consciousness and move into more higher levels of layers of consciousness, you know, it, it affects me. So that's sort of my my purpose of, of a lot of the work that I do is about sharing and, and helping raise consciousness with others. So you say you're a mindset coach. Tell me. I've never heard that term uh, specifically. So what is a mindset coach? Yeah, a lot of people think about like a coach as being like a life coach or maybe in a sports or something like that. The mindset coach is really about dealing with the landscapes of the mind, you know, our paradigms, our perceptions, our belief systems. You know, I recognize that, you know, the things that we do in life, For example, if someone wants to go out and they want to create a change in their life, what they're typically going to do, and I think this is what we're taught to do, is to go outside of ourselves, go to the situations, go to the circumstances, the conditions, the events, the happenings of life, and to change things there. Whereas, you know, from my perspective, that's the result. And if you really, really want to change these things, I mean, truly change these things, I'm not talking about changing how they look, changing how they feel, you know, temporarily, because that's typically what happens when we go outside of ourselves to change things, but to go to the source. And I believe that we are the cause of just about everything that we go through in life. You know, our purposes are going to drive us in different directions and specific directions so that we can grow and become the person that we are, I guess, meant to be or can be going to have that opportunity to do that. And I believe all of that starts in the mind. I believe it all starts with our belief systems, you know, which are based on the things that we've been taught or the things that we've learned for whatever reason or through whatever avenue that happened throughout, you know, our life. But I believe that starting in the mind is really the uh, the source to creating that change in your life. Mm-hmm. And I was reading on your website you like to understand, get people to understand the why behind their actions. So if, yeah. if I'm a, a client and I, I just walk in and I say, 
you know, I, I'm not succeeding in life and, and everything just seems to be failing around me. You know, what would what would you say to that person or what what's your sort of starting approach? Well, I always like to begin with the why, because your why is like the fuel, right? Your your why is going to drive your passions. It's going to drive your inspirations. It's it's basically going to drive all the things that you do. If you have a big enough why, so if you have a big enough purpose, like this is really why I want to do that, and you get in touch with that, that's going to drive you through those processes that typically will stop a person. So when you say you create a new why in your life, a new passion, a new uh, direction that you want to go, and this is life because this happens. And so you know, when you're going in that new direction, if you have a strong enough reason why you want that direction, why you want that lifestyle, why you want those results, when you can connect with that, that's going to push you through those tough times. You know, there's stages and phases that we go through. Change is a process. You know, success is a process. Whatever it is that you want to do in life, you got to go through a process. Everything falls under the law of process. And so your why really allows you to become grounded because along your journey, you're going to become ungrounded, right? Because the happenings of life, you're going to go through the emotional roller coasters. You're going to go through the things that are going to, you know, potentially distract you from where it is that you're going, from what it is that you want. And a good, solid, strong why will bring you back. And that will allow you to autocorrect your, um, you know, your actions and take you in the directions that you need to keep going in order to create what it is that you want. So I think a good, strong why is is really the beginning place. Well, and I think it arms us with uh, a little bit more information. We sometimes unconsciously are striving to achieve things or extract something out of situations in our lives, and we don't know the why. And I, I found with with myself that when I when I ask myself, and I, I use what is my motivation, so it's the same as what you're saying. What is my why? What am I trying to get here? I, yeah. I noticed a lot of behaviors that, you know, were not necessary for me to continue moving forward with. You know, I constantly I was striving to get attention from people. And and when I asked myself, why, w what am I trying to get out of this? It was the answer that came back was that I'm I'm insecure. Now, like what you're saying, I go, why? Why am I insecure? And I, I just keep inserting that question into into this process with myself and i found it it can be very enlightening to ask yourself why do i do the things i do what am i trying to achieve out of this what are my underlying motivations with all of this and it it sort of has been a tool to stop me from engaging in things that are really not that purposeful but they they maybe satisfy the desires of my ego or they they my ego will delight in you know yeah. achieving these things but it's not helping me it's not yeah. uh, moving me forward or bringing more consciousness into my life yeah and you know doing there's there's an exercise called the five by and so basically it, it, you kind of go through that and what a great growth tool i mean what a great example that you just brought up you know starting to Really question yourself. I think deep inner introspection is so necessary. And I often say we're not taught how to think in life. We're taught what to think. Do this, do that, do this. You know, we go to school, there's one right answer. And if you don't get that one right answer they tell you is the right answer, you get punished. Right? You get a bad grade or maybe you miss out on something. Maybe you don't get the candy, whatever it is. And so here in life, in the real world, there's never really one right answer. There's not really even a right or wrong. These are just judgments, and they vary from person to person, from culture to culture, uh, you know, from ethnicity to eth ethnicity. I mean, there is no singular path, but we're taught that there is, and we're taught to walk that. You know, what a what a path of conformity. And I think people like you and I, we don't do well with conformity. We we are free thinkers. We need to express ourselves in unique ways. And, you know, being in a system where we're taught one way, where we're taught to conform, being a free thinker and someone who wants to rise above, you know, that level of consciousness and do greater things, 
you know, that really creates a lot of conflict, such as low self-esteem, like, oh, I'm not worthy. And so then what we do is we start to build in our life all of these, what I call overcompensations, right? Like, I need to be heard. For me, growing up, uh, the youngest of three boys, a lot of rejection, a lot of, you know, stuffing my feelings down because I wasn't safe to express myself or to feel my feelings. And so what I did, which you, you got two paths that are usually taken. You got the person who's going to shut down. They're going to just become quiet and reserved, you know, shut off from the world. And then you got the rebel and they're going to become really, really loud. Well, that was me. I was the rebel. I needed to be heard. So I created this overcompensation, which it was very destructive. You know, I got kicked out of school many times, ended up just dropping out, getting a GED. Um, I didn't do well in a lot of areas because I needed that validation because I wasn't good enough. So I needed someone to tell me I was good enough because I believed I wasn't good enough. And so using the question of why, like you said, you know, why do I need this validation? What is it actually given to me? And so everything has a reward, you know, getting the validation in these unhealthy ways that's that is serving you. But it's not serving you according to the direction you want to go. And so by asking that question, why, and saying, you know, what's really, really going on here, you can get down to the seed, the core, the calls, and that's in the belief system. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like one thing that I would add to what you're saying there, you started talking about, you know, we're we're not taught to, uh, about our thinking. And I, one thing I don't think we're, we've been taught properly is how not to think. And, you know, this is a point that I make um, almost every podcast or when I'm public speaking is that we're taught that we need to be thinking um, all the time and we need to be thinking the right way. And, and we're never taught how to just hold back and just let go of the thoughts that are coming to us, because I, I think the core of my most genius moments come through when I'm when I'm not thinking, when I'm more surrendered and I'm listening. So, you know, to to be able to use the mind as a tool is great. And to be able to set it down when it's not needed is is absolutely necessary uh, on this journey of life. Yeah, I totally agree. And, you know, I mean, think about all the things that we are taught. You know, we're not taught about the most basic things. I mean, the most basic things, right? Emotions, self-regulation. Like you said, how to think and how not to think, right? How to set the mind down, how to set it aside, how to deal with real life things. And that's why, I mean, you look around, this world is sick. There's a lot of sick people in this world, and it's because they don't know what to do. So they keep doing the same things in a different way, and they keep themselves sick. But as we know, sickness is a very profitable business. And so the system, I think that we're here to outgrow this system. Right. We're here to to reach a higher level of consciousness than the system itself that taught us. And I, I think that, you know, that path is becoming uh, more of a priority for more people in this world. But there's so many things. I saw a, a meme the other day. It said, you know, I've realized the second half of life is designed to work through all the things that happened to me in the first half of life. Yeah. Right? And so yeah, life then that. becomes this journey of healing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I had that meme on my social media. Yeah. <laughs> but it's you know, so God, true. It's absolutely true, Mike. And one thing that I wanted to share is is talking, and you, you cued me, that was sort of my next question to you, but um, emotional resiliency. And and I, I think this was a topic that I could have dug into a lot deeper sooner on my my spiritual path and in my spiritual path. So when I when I think about my my resiliency and my ability to manage and regulate my emotions, I had been operating as an emotional child most of my life. You know, I was reading a book by Thomas Keating, and he was talking about carrying forward that emotional child. When when we're born, we're born to, we're instinctively, we know to scream for our needs. But as we mature into adults, we start to scream for our wants. So that sort of transforms into 
now whatever I want, I'm screaming. And I, I may not be outwardly screaming, but I could be screaming in my mind and in a simple lineup at a grocery store could cause me to have a temper tantrum and, and not understanding my emotions and dragging that emotional child into adulthood has had really stifled my growth and my ability to to really move forward in, in more of a purposeful life. Mm. So when you talk about on your site, you say you help people with anxiety and, and regulating emotions. How share with me some of your tools that you use to help people understand their emotions, what they are and and how to to more accurately use them as tools. So when we think of emotions, the, you know, knowledge is a huge thing for me. I think knowledge is power. And when you start to learn about yourself and you gain knowledge about the self, it becomes self-empowerment. And so emotions are a big thing because when, when, we, when it comes to like anxiety and depression and stress and fears and things like that, we are experiencing an emotional reaction, a reflection. And so most people don't even know what emotions are. And so here they are out in this world scrambling around to take care of their emotional states and they're trying to self-regulate with the symptoms. And so your emotions are a symptom and it's it's important to understand what emotions are, where they come from and what their purpose is. And so when you understand this this knowledge, it gives you kind of the edge if you will on being able to start handling and, and self-regulating in a much more effective way. So here's kind of the way I break it down. We have a process that takes place in our brain and it's called synapses. So think about two little lightning bolt rods, okay? There's a little zap of electricity from one to the other. Now, if you replace the lightning bolt rods with nerve cell endings, if you could possibly even imagine what that looks like, then that's a thought. A thought is literally an electrical impulse that takes place in the brain. And that electrical impulse creates or stimulates a chemical response. And that chemical, it could be serotonin or dopamine, whatever it is, then runs through certain channels of the body. Okay, that energy, that's an energy, that, that chemical state, that's an energy that moves. So it's an energy in motion, hence emotion, energy in motion. You become aware of that energy in motion and you call it a feeling. So a feeling is a state of awareness of an energy in motion set forth by a thought pattern. So how do we break that down into a very simple to understand uh, concept? So your emotions are nothing more than your body's response to your thoughts. When you think of a happy thought, you feel happy. When you think of a sad thought, you feel sad. When you think of an anxious thought, you think of something, something to worry about, you start to feel anxious or worried. When you think of a, a thought that happened 10 years ago, something that made you sad, you start to feel sad. So one of the most effective ways to start regulating your emotions is to, is to regulate your thinking, right? And so thinking is your first stage of consciousness, okay? This is the subconscious bringing forth an awareness into your consciousness, and we do that in the thought form. And your thoughts then stimulate the emotional response, which act as a fuel to drive your actions. And then your actions ultimately are going to create the outcomes that you experience. And that whole process, let's say you interact with something for the first time, you're exploring it, you have no preconceived ideas or notions about it, it's completely brand new. And so you, you interact with that thing, you notice how it makes you feel, how it makes you interact, and so forth and so on. Now you take that pattern that you've just learned, it stores in the subconscious mind. And then next time you come in contact with anything that's similar or relative to that, it's going to spit out that reaction because it's already learned it. So it doesn't want to go through a process of learning every time it interacts with anything, right? And so it's a very efficient way for the mind to learn right, is to learn it once and then just spit that reaction or spit that, you know, learning that cycle back out. And that's what we call a reaction. And so a lot of these things as a child, we learn. We learn most everything that we need to know about life when we're a child. Now, what we're doing, it's like, so you learn about anger as a child. Well, you're always going to know about anger for the rest of your life, but it's going to express itself in different ways. So we don't have to relearn anger. We're just relearning how to interact with anger so that we can change the response that we automatically produce from that anger. And so 
when you want to change these things, anxieties, fears, depressions, whatever that is, you must understand that you're going through a process of teaching your brain and your body to produce a new response. And so that's not just a process of interacting with it differently. It's a process of going into the mind, dissecting what's there, because in order to change a program in the subconscious mind, you must replace it. You can't just pull an old program out and leave this empty space. Because if you have an empty space, then, you know, that's uncertainty. And uncertainty is one of those uh, ideas that generates anxiety and fear. And so we must we must replace the things that we want to change. And so that's a process that takes some time. And this is where most people, I think, fail in their uh, their journeys to get better. And they go in these cycles, these circles over and over and over. It's because they don't understand that there's a process. They think, oh, if I can work long enough to feel better, then I'm better. And that's not the case. I mean, when you're changing programs, you're changing not just the psychological aspect of what you know or what you've learned, but you're changing the structure of the brain. You literally create neural pathways in the brain. That's what learning is. And that process alone is at least 13 weeks. That's why a lot of your big programs to help people are typically 90 days or longer, because we know scientifically, biologically, that it takes that in order to create that change in a sustainable way. Nobody wants to change. It's kind of like, you know, say somebody comes to me and they want to, they want to get rid of anxiety. And they work long enough, they're in this new program, they're doing something different, and they start feeling better within two to three weeks. I've had some people that are like, oh, I'm good now. I'm I'm going out. I'm doing all this stuff. Everything's good. I'm done. I'm over here like, yeah, that's not quite the way it works. Like, you still got to keep going so that you can make the changes in the brain, not just temporary mm-hmm. changes. And sometimes they'll be like, oh, I'm done. Like, okay. If that's, you know, if you're not willing to go any further, but then five, six months later, they're calling me back. And and change is uh, inevitably it's it's a very difficult thing to 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 work through. And it's such a necessary thing in life. I, I recently just reposted an old video where I was talking about making change and, you know, everything in life changes the there's nothing in this world that's not changing even the rocks are changing underneath the ground so being able to flow with change is sometimes understanding the the anatomy of change and it's i i express it in a way that everything has a certain amount of momentum behind it if we've been behaving and acting a certain way we're chemically uh, wired to to do things a certain way to make that change we have to let the inertia the momentum burn out we have to reaffirm the changes that we want to make it's kind of like if there were, were a motor running and you switch it off and there's if there's no brake on that motor it's going to continue to spin and the first yeah. time that we go back into that old behavior it's like flicking the switch back on that motor it ramps up to full speed again. So like you're saying, it, it takes a, you know, three months, 90 days to to really start solidifying these changes. And I, I find it's helpful to constantly uh, go back to affirming that I I need to change or I want to change. And, yeah. and then when I notice that I'm falling into old behaviors or patterns, it's just to notice not to beat myself up. But just say, oh, hold on, I need to flip that switch off again and continuously go back and make that same choice. Because there were things that I I struggled to change in myself. And I I worked for years trying to change one one thing. But there there was so much inertia behind it. And I, I constantly would flip the switch back on and it ramped right back up to full speed. Yeah, it's kind of funny how it does that, you know. I often think about change, you know, the idea is that change is hard, but I don't really think it's change that we struggle with. I mean, if change itself was hard, then why do we go through so many changes without even thinking about it? Every day you wear new clothes or you do something new or you're watching something new. We don't have any problem with that change. 
right? And so as I've thought about this, I said, okay, well, if it's not change that we struggle with, then what is it that we struggle with when we're working to change? And I think that it, it's not the change itself, but it's letting go of the things that prevent the change. We become so comfortable because everything that we do has a reward. It has a payoff, right? Like you mentioned, you know, beating yourself up, you know, from the outside, that wouldn't make any sense. And you would never encourage somebody else to do that, but yet you'll do it yourself because, you know, you may think that, oh, if I, if I beat myself up, that'll push me into gear. That'll, you know, force me to make that change. But there's so little logic behind that type of thinking. And we have to bring that to awareness because we know that awareness is the key to life. That's what gives us choice. And choice is our greatest power. And so when it comes to something like that, if we can step out of that process, start to filter our thinking in a new way, we can address things like that. Because when you when you beat yourself up or you put yourself down, that's abuse. It's self-abuse. And if you did it to someone else, it would be abusive behavior. And so when you think about the change that you're actually trying to make or trying to create in your life, what you're doing is an act of love. You're doing this to help yourself. You're doing this to become more, to become better, to propel you to higher states. And how are you going to get there? By holding yourself down, by putting yourself down. Not only that, you know, growing up in life, we learn that doing things wrong, making a bad choice or a poor choice or making a mistake is something that's wrong and should be avoided. And I completely disagree because the best lessons, the most valuable lessons, the most significant changes I've ever made in my life, they came through those poor choices. Now, I'm not advocating go make poor choices, but go make poor choices. Just learn from them. Take them, do something with them, help them propel you. Don't become defined by them, become refined by them. The experiences that we have come from the stories, the ideas, the beliefs, the associations that we have learned or given to things. And that's why people's experience will vary. You know, this person may say this is right. This person may say it's wrong. Well, who's right? Well, they're both right according to them, right? But they both could be wrong according to truth. Who knows? But starting to understand these processes and really diving in and understanding what it is that we're doing when we talk about trying to change our life and we talk about wanting or doing something different and we talk about our wants and needs. And that's another one. You know, your needs are met. You don't need anything. Your needs are completely met. Everything that you do isn't based on your needs now. It's based on your wants, your desires. And that's another major shift that we can when we can recognize that, hey, my needs are met. I'm not a, it's not about my needs anymore. I got food, I got water, I got clothing, I got shelter, I got my physical needs met, I've got my emotional needs met. Okay, I'm saying that I need this, then so am I inadequate without it? Is there something lacking in me? And coming to the realization that there's not, that will help you expand rather than trying to meet the standard of being what you need. And that's another part, I think, of that validation. Mm -hmm. You know, and when you when you talk about needs, I I would include um, the need for love. We that's the emotional needs for sure. We Love's need the to, answer. and and the love love is is so much. It's like thirty steps or a thousand steps beyond an emotion. Because when I when I think about love, I think of it as a divine power that that lives inside of us that we don't possess or own, but we're allowed to use it freely and and i think it's one of those things that when we take care of that need that it it nourishes our life in a different way than our wants could ever nourish our life and and for me nourishing that that need for love to love myself to love others and love the world has has become a tool that is become helped me become more spiritually empowered and in in your coaching like on your website you said you could speak about spiritual empowerment so what are the the key things you think we need to become more spiritually empowered because I, I think you know that the topic of love is is certainly a very important one in that arena you know love is at the center of it all 
It, it truly is. And, and, and I agree with you. I don't think love is a feeling. I, I, I think it produces feelings. I think it can, I think you can feel it, but I don't think it itself is a feeling. I think it's, it's an action. And when I think about that, that love that I feel, that spiritual love that I feel, the way that I'm able to, uh, I guess, really connect with that. And I, and I think about this and I, I meditate on this uh, quite often. The, the love that I feel uh, from whatever it is that it is, my soul, universe, God, creator, whatever that is, um, has always been there. It's always been there for me. It was the greatest act of love, unconditional, no matter whether I did something bad or wrong or poor choice or or whatever. It was always there. It was always giving. It was always uh, there to comfort me. It was something I can always rely on and still can. And to me, that's an act that's far beyond a feeling. It's a it's a it's an understanding based on the the results that I've seen over and over and continuously my whole life. And so I think that love is at the center and starting to, you know, starting with the self, starting to love the self, I think is the first stage or real true step to spiritual enlightenment. Self-help, you know, doing better for yourself is an act of love. And the more you do that, the more spiritually enlightened you're going to be as long as you're moving towards that path. I mean, if you're just doing this for work, I mean, I think it's got to be a dedicated focus. You got to take time if you want to spiritually grow. You got to take time with those spiritual subjects that draw your attention because those are your next steps. And I believe that life is a, a, a very intelligent system and that, that we're all guided. I believe that we're all guided through the different steps, through our unique paths. And so when life calls you, if you'll listen and you'll take those steps of action, even when it's scary and even when you don't understand it, you just, you know, I, I kind of say I live my life in a state of surrender. I don't know what's best for me. I don't know if I've ever met anyone who knows what's best for them. We know what we think from where we're at. But in five years, you know, what's going to be best for you? You have no idea. Nobody has any idea because we don't know what five years is going to look like. And so uh, kind of allowing life to guide you, starting to understand the signs of life, starting to surrender. And it doesn't mean that you don't do anything. And it's not a passive way of living. In fact, it's it's a bit more active than than not. But starting to understand that life itself is here to help you. I, I always say that everything in life is a gift. Everything in life is a gift. And and you talk about surrender um, not is something that stops us from doing everything where it causes us to be inactive. I, I see that as well. I see surrender is the ability to set down our own desires and, and to engage what's landing at our feet because everything that's landing at our feet is, is what we're supposed to be serving. It's what we're supposed to be doing. If, if somebody shows up in my day, when I'm surrendered, I'm engaged with that person. And that, that's what surrender is to me. And, it, and if I can share one more thing about love is that we, because I feel like it's a, an essential ingredient for life and it's something that we require, I think it's important for people to understand is that we don't have to get it outside of ourselves. And, and we constantly cleave to others to give us our, our little sliver of love and, and we get we become beggars when we can't find it in ourselves. So I maybe encourage people to start to look for the love that lives inside of you. And it it, it is going to live beyond, outside of the context of your mind. It's going to require us to maybe set down the mind a little bit and to journey inward to a deeper place, moving into the heart. You know, the heart, if you just focus on it, it could be a doorway into that that place that love lives inside of us because love is divine and we have our own well to draw from. So it's it's so essential that we draw from that well of love inside of ourselves. Now, before we go, I, I would like to ask you about your books. You've written a handful of books. So tell me a, a little bit about that and we'll uh, conclude this session. All right. So my most recent publication was in 2020. Uh, you know, I've done a lot of work with anxiety and depression 
And so I wanted to create a guidebook um, based on my philosophies and how I teach people. And I've been helping people for, you know, more than uh, 12 years now uh, about how to step out of that. And so the book is called Fight Back End the Cycles of Anxiety and Depression. It's on Amazon. You can find it on my website, mikeoglesby.com. Um, and it's just a way to, to you know, create a bigger outreach so that I can help people. You know, I've done a lot of really, really cool work, um, got a lot of great feedback. I've helped thousands of people throughout the world. Uh, it's a really a, a place of passion because I've been able to overcome those things. I don't have depression. I don't have suicidal ideations. I don't have the OCDs. I don't have the debilitating anxieties. And so I teach people how I was able to get rid of these things uh, in a very practical format. Uh, so that's Fight Back. Uh, and that's really the the you know, the primary book that I've put out there for a while. But I've got a book that's going to be coming out this year uh, called Bigger Than Fear. Uh, and it addresses many of those things, but it, it, it expands. And so in Bigger Than Fear, we're starting to really expand on the true understanding of the path, the journey from that, we'll say the darkness to the light. Uh, that can enhance the spiritual awakening as well, uh, if that's what a person wants. Get rid of those overcompensations, no no longer relying on everyone else. You know, something I'll just briefly elaborate. Uh, you know, when we seek outside of ourselves for that love and that power that we so desperately want, we tend to seek it from those people that didn't give it to us. And isn't that interesting that we go back to the dry well to try to find water, right? It's one of the first mm. places we go back to. And then we get all frustrated. Why aren't they giving me this? Because they don't have it. They don't have the capacity to give you that because they don't have it for themselves. And so they give it to you the best way that they know how, and that might be the absence of it. But I, I truly believe people are trying the best that they can, the best that they know how from the point or vantage point of knowledge and understanding they have. But I just think most people are lacking that understanding. And so by going outside of yourself, you become dependent and you become an effect, you become a result. And so the key is to go inside of yourself, learn how to love yourself, because if you're not loving yourself, you're not taking care of yourself, then why would you expect anyone else to do it? It's not their job. It's your job first. And you hear things like be the change you want to see in the world, because when you make those internal changes, when you change that dialogue, when you change those paradigms within yourself, they tend to express themselves outside of you. And then you will start to experience it outside of you. But at this point in time, you don't really need it so much outside of yourself because you've cultivated it within yourself. And so my books, especially Bigger Than Fear, that's really what it's about. It's about that inner journey. It, it breaks down from the beginning. It lays out the philosophies. It talks about the journey. It talks about the process. It talks about the mind. It helps you understand the subconscious mind, the conscious mind, how we interact with things, how we experience things. And it teaches the concepts, the tools, and the techniques to make those internal subconscious shifts so that we can experience life consciously in a very different but much better way. So that's going to be coming out this year. I don't have a date set on that yet, but, you know, just be on the lookout. And for those of you that, you know, want to want to know more about that, you know, check me out on the social media. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, uh, TikTok, LinkedIn, X. I'm pretty much on all of them. And just look up my name, Mike Oglesby or author Mike uh, Oglesby, and you'll find me there. You'll be able to, to get the updates and stuff like that as well. Wonderful. Well, thanks for coming on today. I look forward to, to sharing this interview with everyone. Thank you so much, Ned. I had a, had a great time talking with you. I look forward to talking with you again. All right. Thank you for taking time to listen. Stay tuned for our next episode of the You Matter podcast. Have a wonderful day.